Okay, we are going to get started. And I'm going to go through our list right now and welcome the folks we have here. Gary, hey, good to see you, buddy. Uh, from My buddy from Milwaukee here. Um, Laszlo, he's a recent a new Facebook friend. Good to have you. Mary, good to have you on board with us. Melinda, welcome. Tracy from Florida, good to be have you here. And my buddy Walt Walker, Facebook buddy from Chicago, good to have you here as well. Uh, we had like 38 people signed up, so we'll probably have a few folks joining us as we um, get into the meeting. Okay, so let's go ahead and get this started. I'm going to make some opening remarks, introduce my co-presenter today, Thomas Staub, a good friend of mine from Colorado, lives kind of out there between Denver and Colorado Springs and that area, known Tom for a long time, but I'll introduce him in just a second. I, I just want to mention that I really need to try to hold this to about 45 minutes because I've got another engagement I've got to get to right after this. And I know you guys uh, on the line here are probably also fitting this in your schedule. So I um, appreciate that as well. Uh, so you guys know me. I'm Randy Rice, Rice Consulting Services. Um, Tom, uh, you want to say just a quick word about yourself here? I'm Tom Staub. I'm president of Windridge International. And Randy's correct. We've known each other for a long time. We gave up trying to figure out how long. So I'm just happy to be working with, with him again. Well, I'm happy to have you along for the ride here on, uh, on this webinar. Uh, so just at the outset, I just want to tell you guys, uh, I think most of you know me pretty well, that we're not going to do a hard sell. I know sometimes you, you come to a webinar and they build you up to saying if you join within the next two days, you get a special discount. We're not going to do that kind of thing. Um, we're just going to kind of lay out some things that we hope that you'll find helpful in doing assessments. And I, I will also be upfront that um, we really do favor uh, independent assessments. Um, and we'll get into that reasoning why. But, but should you want to use this for your own self-assessment, you can certainly do that. Now, at the end of the session, um, we're going to have a drawing for um, my Testing Dirty Systems book. If you're in the US, if you're outside of the US, then I can get you a digital copy of the Top 10 Challenges book. Now, if you win the Dirty Systems book, but you'd rather have the Top 10 Challenges book, book in digital format, then we can do that too. So it's totally whatever you want to do. And uh, we uh, welcome your questions. If you have some of those, I'm going to be checking the chat box um, down in the uh, lower left-hand corner of your uh, window there. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to type them in the chat window. Uh, you can also uh, email us those later, and we can answer them as well. So we welcome those questions. Uh, I'm going to kind of do this in a conversational way with Tom. Uh, but at the very beginning, we just kind of left this open-ended. Uh, secrets of uh, assessments, uh, software assessments, because they can really take many forms. They can be a risk assessment, a process assessment. You can see the slide here. And that also reminds me, too, of one other thing. You know, I, I go to these webinars, too, and I know how it works. You, uh, you, you get the audio going, and then you start working on other things. Well, there's going to be some, we're not going to just read from the slides, okay? There are going to be things that are on the slides that we may not actually mention. Uh, so if you really want to take full advantage of the webinar, I would encourage you to do that. The question always comes up, will the slides be posted? Uh, yes, they will be posted um, out on my blog at randallrice.blogspot.com. And so if you uh, are connected with me like that, I'll also make notice on my Facebook page um, so you'll know where, where these are at, and also where the recording of the uh, webinar is at. So you shouldn't have any problem accessing this. And there's also a free checklist that I'm going to have uh, as a link here at the end 
uh, so you'll you'll see where to find that as well. Okay, so uh, if you know the, the very first question that I would ask someone, you know, if they were thinking about an assessment, would be think about it like a trip. Okay, if if you're going to take a trip and you decided where you wanted to go, what would be the most important thing that you'd need to know after? you decided on your destination. And so think about that for a second. And, you know, there could be many things that, that you might think of. You know, you might think of, well, uh, what kind of car do I want to take? How much stuff do I want to take? You know, all, all of those kind of things. Who's going to watch the dogs or the cats or, or whatever? But I would suggest that the most important thing that you need to know is where you're at right now <laughs> or where your starting point is going to be. And so for for the longest time, as I explain assessments, especially to senior management, uh, I say, you know, it's kind of like a mall map. You know, you, you go to the mall, and I don't know about you, but I get turned around in malls the times that I get dragged to them uh, <laughs> as my joke is you've seen one mall, you've seen them all. And um, the the thing about it is assessments, I, I try to keep a real uh, even expectation on these. They're not meant to be good news or bad news. They're just an assessment. They're just a reading of where you are right now. They're actually kind of a snapshot of, of where you're at. So I just kind of want to also build that explanation out. Now, uh, Tom, I, I'm going to kind of throw this to you for a moment um, about our thought process of coming up with this webinar, you know, kind of our motivation behind it. So if you'd like to kind of speak to that, um, then we'll go on from there. What I have found is that uh, companies consistently find that they don't deliver projects on time and on budget. And if you go look at the statistics, uh, it, it's been the last several years, every time I see one of the surveys done, it's only about 25% of the projects are delivered on time and on budget. And another complaint I hear, and I'm sure Randy does too, is that the testing process is not performing up to expectations. Well, that's an open-ended question because what's your expectations? And uh, it's one of those, I'll know it when I see it, but companies try to fix their problems or perceived problems, and they don't really solve them. So what they wind up doing is wasting money and time and not really fixing the problem as they see it. So then they keep asking the question, well, what went wrong? And that's what an assessment tries to help you figure out is what is the true problem and what are the symptoms? And so that you can actually go in there and fix the problem. Okay, Randy? Absolutely. You know, I think in IT, and we see this in other areas too, but we, we kind of have a, a chronic practice, bad practice. <laughs> of diving into the solution before we fully understand the problem. And I'm sure most of us on the call have seen that many times, that uh, we we don't know the current situation fully. We don't know all the various perspectives. Now, it is probably impossible to know all the perspectives, but uh, Tom is right. A lot of projects do fail. And a lot of times, we're not really fully aware of even where we're at, what the issues are, and how do we get to the place we want to be. Now, I'm, I'm of the opinion that it doesn't have to be that hard to do. But here's another little thing to think about. Uh, and this is, a Tom, this is a slide that Tom uh, put in the deck, so I'll let him speak to it as well. But I've... I, I'm certainly very much aware of this, that a lot of the things we see are symptomatic. Uh, we, we see the tip of the iceberg. So, Tom, uh, tell us what 
you found about that stuff that lies below the surface? Well, what lies below the surface is what we can't see, and it takes a lot of research to dig it out. And uh, people will say, well, I really know what the problem is. Or if you go and ask, send out a questionnaire, you're going to get answers from all the way from, hey, it's running great, we don't need to fix anything, to where, to the other end of the spectrum, to where, they say, well, it's just horrible. We need to scrap the whole thing. Well, the true answer lies somewhere in between. So how do we know what the true answer is? Well, we've got to go in there and dig. We've got to look at everything. And we're going to be talking about in a little bit uh, what are we going to be looking at to find out what's laying below the surface. So, Randy, if you want to go to the next slide. Okay, absolutely. I'll, I'll just throw this in too. I cannot tell you how many assessments I have personally done where we started out with someone making the statement, well, we know where we're at. We know we're bad. <laughs> we, we know we're CMMI level one or, or something to, to, to that effect. And then on those very same assessments, when it comes to the readout, uh, I will bring up some things that I've uh, uncovered during the assessment that totally shocked management. Um, it, it's really true that you know that people. I don't know. They 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 tend to sometimes hide the bad news from management, or they tend to hide the bad news from each other. And it's almost like going to the doctor. Now, I don't want to elevate ourselves to the point of being a, a you know medical professional by any means, but it's almost like going to the doctor and saying, "I know what's wrong with me," you know. Can, can you give me something for it? And uh, the, the doctor may look at it and say, well, you know, I, I know you think you have a bad cough. Do you know you have pneumonia? Uh, that kind of thing. So uh, it, it is definitely a lot of things underneath the, the surface. Now, uh, this is another Tom slide, which I, I've, I've always thought of that this is a kind of a guiding principle, actually, for me that uh, we can't solve the problem, this is from Einstein, we, we, the significant problems we have can't be solved at the same level of thinking with which we created them. So that also indicates that we need to gain a different perspective, I think, of, of, of what we're dealing with. And when I, I, I was actually um, in engineering school for a while when I was in college, and that was one of the main ways we solved problems was getting a different perspective. That was what the teachers drilled into it over and over again, that you need multiple eyes on the problem. So I'm going to go ahead and, and move on to um, kind of uh, another way to see assessments are you can look at them from various areas and sometimes uh, I'll get called in, I'm sure Tom will attest to his experience in this, to look at which tools do we need or which processes are best. In fact, I had a situation one time where they called me in to do a tool assessment, and then before I even got started doing the tool assessment, they said, wait, 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 we've changed our mind. We think we probably need to do a process assessment first. And I, th I said, I think you're right because until you understand your processes, you're not going to know which tools you really need. Tom, you have anything to add uh, to this slide? Well, Randy, when you've gone in and you they say, we, we want you to look at the process, but we also want you to look at the tools, and then you ask, well, give me a list of the tools you're using, and once you get into it, have you found that there's more tools out there than what they knew they had, and a lot of them are sitting on the shelf and have never been used? Oh, ab absolutely. In fact, the, the example that I just gave, um, not only did they have quite a shelf full of tools, but they had three actively used tools, all doing the same thing, all from different vendors, all using different scripting languages, and um, it, it was a real, I don't know, uh, <laughs> stew pot, uh, I guess, maybe, of, of different tools and, and ways that they were trying to use them. And uh, we were trying to unify that a little bit. 
um, yeah, there was some reason they used tools over others, but yes, they discovered that there were a lot of things um, that they didn't uh, use. And in that particular case, one of the stunning findings from that assessment was their main flagship product underwent over 500 releases in one year. Okay? Now, when you do the math on that, and they didn't release on weekends, and this was a, a stock trading kind of application, uh, they were changing, they were releasing multiple times per day. And so I call that the rapid release vortex, but that was just an example of one of the stunning findings from the, re, uh, from the assessment. Okay, now let me ask you another question. I've got a love-hate relationship with questionnaires. Uh, <laughs> I love them because it allows me to uh, get inputs from a multiple layers of the organization. I hate them because you got to keep remembering that this is somebody's personal opinion and it has, is not based on fact. Uh, what's your relationship with them? Very much the same thing that, that people, you really have to be careful with questionnaires. Um, that they, They're good to kind of get an, an initial sense of people's opinions and, and things, but um, if it's a numerical rating, people are giving something, they're typically going to gravitate toward the middle, so you kind of have to be careful about that. Uh, Dot Graham has an interesting practice that she does. Um, she does not give a questionnaire that has uh, an odd number of response options. So she'll make it an even number. So you've got to pick one side of the spectrum or the other. So if she gives, she will not give a, a questionnaire that has five options to it because it's so easy to pick that middle option. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, I, I also think when you compare, you have to balance out questionnaires with, with the other things you have on here on the slide, like measurements and historical data, and even anecdotal data. Um, I was doing a, an assessment one time, and we were talking about lessons learned. and. The, the manager made a statement that was just an epiphany to me, and they said, well, we sure don't want another Project X to happen again. And I said, well, what was so bad about Project X? And they said, oh, well, we just lost about a million dollars on it and took a, it was about a year over schedule. And, I, you know, they didn't have any of that captured in a lessons learned, but it was burned into their mind. You know, it was <laughs> it, it was like, you know, personally we make mistakes, right? we buy things or we embark on projects or we take vacations and we say, man, I'm never going to do that again. And nothing on a questionnaire, okay, nothing on a checklist for that, but they sure knew about it and they that was a motivation actually to do the assessment that I was on at the time. Well, and that's why you go in after the questionnaires and do the interviews, the measurements, and the historical data to find out what is really going on. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm just checking the um, the question box here to see if we have any questions, and we don't. Uh, uh, Laszlo from Budapest, by the way, all the way from Budapest, says hi everyone, and Laszlo, welcome. Uh, it's good. It's good to have you with us. Um, so let's go on uh, to this curious picture of the <laughs> person with the mouse trap and what is the bait? The bait is money, isn't it? That's a great. Yeah. That's a great picture. Uh, I, I found, think. Go ahead. What I've found is that people fall into traps when they uh, are trying to do assessments on their own, and uh, that bait of money is what they wind up losing or wasting uh, on a lot of these assessments. So that was one reason why I loved this graphic here. I thought it depicted very well what we're trying to talk about today. Okay, well, let, let's talk about the traps, okay? Um, and, and as I said, we're, we're going to 
necessarily read through all of these things. Uh, so if, if you're uh, kind of multitasking there, uh, you, you may miss a few points on the slides if you're not uh, focused in on here. But, but we'll go through these anyway, and we'll start with, uh, with the first trap about really not objectively understanding the current situation. And to me, the word, the key word in that first uh, bullet point there is objective. Uh, because we, we all see things from our own perspective. And I want to give a little personal friend story. Uh, this happened to a friend of mine, and Tom and I were talking about it as we were developing these slides. I had a friend one time who uh, had a pool, a swimming pool, and it developed a very severe algae problem. And I mean that water just turned totally green. And so he was told that he needed to scrub the pool around the edges and the bottom. Those of you who have pools perhaps know the drill here. Um, and so he did, but he, he, he couldn't reach everything. He, he couldn't, like, get all the bottom of the pool. So he did something that was not very smart, actually. He jumped in the pool. And he, d he jumped in with the broom and everything to try to clean around the edges and around the bottom. And he was successful in doing that, but in the process of doing it, he developed a very, sadly, very serious medical condition. And a lot of us in our organizations, we are in the pool, okay? <laughs> we are, uh, I don't want to be too unkind here, but you, you may be in the pool of dysfunction, okay? And things are so dysfunctional that it's kind of hard to step back sometimes and even see what is in the dysfunction. And that's what I think about, uh, about sometimes um, I, I'm in a situation right now with a project where they've asked me for a recommendation uh, for an auditor. And I will not recommend myself because, first of all, I'm not an auditor, and second of all, I've been in the, the project now for a year, and I'm biased. So um, I, I think this idea of objectivity and being unbiased is really an important thing to think through uh, whenever you're doing an assessment. And even your assessor may be a little bit biased. Well, Randy, what I've found is that a lot of people go in with, uh, and they want, they say, well, what have you done in, in the past? And they want to look at it. Well, I'm odd. I don't want to look at what they've done in the past because I want to look at it objectively and see what I actually find out in my assessment. That's right. And, and you know, I think people have good intentions, but when you go in and ask, start doing interviews and things, you really, I, I personally will ask the same question basically in different ways. People, I, I'm not saying people are lying to me, but they have their own version of the truth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So uh, I like to see some documentation or some examples. Let's put it, put it that way. Uh, well, when I go into an interview, the first thing I do is ask the people I'm interviewing, tell me what, tell me a little bit about what you do and what you think is the problem. And it's amazing what they disclose. Yeah, yeah. And especially if you ask that same question across various levels, and we'll get to that. But um, exactly, you, you'll, you'll find that... Um, Talking to enough people, you'll you'll find out some pretty interesting things. Uh, let's go on okay. to the next slide. I think this is huge. Um, not having senior management support uh, going into this is really, I mean, you've got to nail that down, right? The slide didn't change, Randy. Oh, it it. Well, it changed, as the developers say, it changed on my machine. <laughs> it, it'll probably okay. appear. It'll probably appear on yours in a second, but uh, I'll go ahead and speak to it for just a second. It, the, the senior management support is critical, um, and I've even gone in to do assessments where there was senior management support and still had some issues getting the, uh, the sponsorship to move forward with some of the recommendations. And, you know, I'm a, I've been around this... Uh, this rodeo for a while now. I've, gone, I've done many of these. I understand that not every uh, 
recommendation I have will be accepted. But there needs to be some degree, I think, of buy-in from senior management and, and their support that they're going to at least be serious about going forward with what the assessment uh, uncovers and at least some of the goals for improvement, whatever whatever it is that you're focusing on in your assessment. Well, and that's what I've found is I've gone in and they said, yeah, you can go ahead and do the assessment. But when I when I actually come in with the recommendations, they're not willing to uh, go in and actually um, implement what we find. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you something, too. Uh, an interesting wrinkle on this, uh, one experience I had, uh, the CIO actually called me in to do the assessment. And this was a... Um, major credit card clearinghouse. Uh, so they, they were handling literally hundreds of millions of dollars of transactions per day. And they were fixing problems on the fly nightly. And it was just, I, I, the turnover was insane. Um, and, at, you know, I gave my, my presentation at, to senior management and the director of marketing kind of folded his arms and said, you know what, the only metric I care about is we haven't lost any customers. And I said, well, you know, it's kind of like a kitchen where back in the, the or a restaurant where back in the kitchen they're dropping about two out of every three plates of food after it's being prepared. And I said, and meanwhile in the dining room, no one sees it and they don't know. And I said, would you want to run a business that way? you know, where you're wasting so much stuff in the back room. <laughs> About um, three months later, I got a call from the CIO. She said, I just wanted to let you know that I've moved on. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. She said, we had a situation. Remember your analogy of the restaurant? I said, oh, yeah. And she said, well, a few weeks ago, the restaurant doors were flung open. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, uh, they had a major incident and um, but it was interesting because this one person uh, had enough influence to kind of just put the squelch on everything there. Well, so I, yeah. And have you found that uh, the CIO uh, says they want an unbiased assessment, but really what they want is a yes person to come in and uh, echo what they think is wrong. Right, I've had that too. I don't think that was going on in this situation, but that 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 can certainly happen. They 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 want to bring in someone, and and in fact, sometimes this is a legitimate uh, reason uh, for an outside assessment because, hey, you know, inside the organization, you maybe have been telling someone in your management structure for many many years what the problems are, but they won't listen to you because you're part of the team. You know, you're right in there. And um, that kind of goes back to, to trap number one, doesn't it? But, right. uh, yeah, sometimes they're just looking for a uh, kind of a, a yes person kind of validation. Now, the, I, I'm on the third trap here about doing the assessment using uh, internal resources. Now, that I'm not saying, or we're not saying you can't be successful by doing this, but you really have to be careful. Uh, about this because um, in an organization, as you know, there are politics and there are uh, histories between people and you really have to have a good plan going forward and you really have to work at being objective and unbiased. Um, Tom, what have you seen in doing self-assessments? Well, self-assessments, what usually winds up happening is, and we're going to be talking about this on the next trap, is that people don't view the assessment team as unbiased. They figure they've got an axe to grind turf to protect. So what happens is that when the findings come out, it turns into a big argument. And so nothing really happens. Uh, they get so hung up in arguing about the findings that they don't do anything. Yeah. You have to have a lot of credibility 
um, as an assessor in any sense. And um, it's really, you kind of have to work to build that credibility. And even if you have a lot of credibility in the organization, um, how many times have you heard something like, well, we brought in XYZ, you know, from outside, you know, from this company, and this is what they told us, and so therefore, you know, we feel like this is the way we need to go. And it was the old joke about being coming from 50 miles away and having a briefcase uh, that built kind of the credibility there. But but you're right. I mean, a lot of times internally, uh, there's a little baggage. That, that you have, and at the end of the day, um, it kind of you have to fight for the uh, for the right, I guess, to, to have your your findings heard. Uh, now, I, I will tell you this as kind of a balance point: I've come in after a self assessment and verified the results of the self assessment. So, you know, if you don't have a lot of funding, um, you might do some of the legwork, uh, but even at that. Uh, I would go back in as an independent consultant and revisit some of the findings from the self-assessment. And um, I've actually found some things that were missed in, in the self-assessment. And I, I was able to make some confidences that, and that's another point about this, sometimes people will not open up and give the truth the true story to someone inside the organization because they don't know where that's going to go. They, they don't know where they're going to get the information. Randy, move on to trap four. I think we're we're hitting into that real heavily right now. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, picking the wrong assessment team. Now, now this can be internal as well as external. I mean, right. you you can pick the wrong external uh, assessment team as well. And um, I'll just give one example of that. You may pick a team or an organization that has their own tool or their own process. And you have to be very careful about that because um, the external group can be jaded toward their own way of doing things, and that's the only way they do things. They can only play one song, and that's the one they're going to play for you. Well, and that's what I've found, too, that that if you get a, an assessment team that that has a product to sell, that's what they're going to push. And so you're not really getting an unbiased assessment. Yeah, and, and I think your, your bullet here on the team should represent all levels of the organization. Um, that, that's huge because at the top of the organization, uh, the picture gets very rosy. Uh, when you get down into the trenches is when you find that, you know, here's what's really broken. And well, so, But you've got a problem there, too, because you can put people from lower levels of the organization, which so you need to get a different viewpoint. But if the top-level people don't let them actually speak or express their true opinions, then you've lost that whole uh, unbiased portion of it. Have you ever gone into a, an organization, Tom, where there was a lot of fear? Oh, yeah. A lot of fear and manipulation. That, that just really kills it, doesn't it? It does, and what I've found is that people will actually try to tell management what's going on, and they get beat down so much that, you know, they just give up. And when I come in with my team and actually give them a uh, venue for expressing their opinion and tell them, we're not going to record who said what, man, it's just like the dam burst. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good point. I, I always try to include that um, in the very first thing I, I will tell someone in an interview that you know, this stays in, in this room, uh, any kind of findings that I uh, compile will be just generically, you know, attributed to this was just what we heard from people. Uh, and th there have been some really interesting things uh, 
you know, it really gives some people some freedom, I think, uh, to, to talk. So well, let's I, move on. I, I tell them I'm like a reporter. I don't, uh, I don't reveal my sources. <laughs> there you go. And that, that's a healthy way to do it. So let's go into trap number five, uh, entering the assessment with preconceived conclusions. Um, that, that, tell me a little bit about what you've seen with this one. Well, I, you know, I think I've walked into uh, assessments before with what I think is really happening, but what happens is that I try to keep an open mind, and uh, so I've had my mind changed during the assessment. I, what I thought coming in is not what's really going on. Uh, I've also been fired off of an assessment because I tell the truth. What, whatever I find, I tell the truth, and that's not what they want to hear. And so I got fired. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, no, I've I've had the same experience, and um, that some people are very uncomfortable with people who ask uncomfortable questions, um, and <laughs> and it's a threat. Uh, and so, uh, but but otherwise. You know, I don't want to be on the other side of that equation. I don't want to be in there uh, just to check off a box, just to confirm someone's uh, thing that they want to have confirmed. Uh, you really, it's the old Jack Nicholson line, you know, you can't handle the truth. You know, you've almost got to be comfortable with that. And, and that's one of the expectations that, that, you, that I personally build out at the beginning. Before I ever walk onto the site or sign the contract that, you know, are, are you willing to be able to handle uh, objectively what comes out of the uh, assessment because sometimes it may not be all that good. It's like, once again, the mall map. Not intended to be good or bad, just, you know, here's what it is. Here's what it is, right. And that's when we get into the next slide is the too narrow scope. I've been brought in saying, I want you to look at my testing. And when I get into the to the assessment, I find it's not your testing that you've got a problem with. It's your whole process, your development process. Yep, yep. And, you know, it can, it can go into the release process. It can go into requirements. Um, it, it's kind of like Gorilla Glue, you know. It just kind of expands on you if, if you're not careful. And, um, yeah, if you're only focusing on one thing and there's, as we all know, when it comes to testing, you can just use that as an example, a test assessment. There's a lot of things that touch testing. Uh, configuration management, release schedules, uh, you know, just uh, the quality of the requirements, um, everything. I, I, you know, I, even when doing a testing assessment, I'll be up front and say, you know, if, if I find some problem areas, I'm, I'll go ahead and report them. I don't want to just automatically increase scope, but this is a very uh, important trap to be aware of that, you know, if you have blinders on with these other areas, then you're going to miss probably the, the, the root cause of the problem. Well, I had one client up in Toronto that uh, could not get a system out on time and on budget. So his solution before I got in there was add more testers. Well, that wasn't well, the problem. <laughs> and a direct violation of Brooks's law. Adding more right. people to a project this late will make it even later. Right. Yep. Okay. Let's move on to number seven. Uh, this is also big. You don't know really you know, what you want to accomplish. You don't know the overall objectives. Um, that that's that you if, if you download the checklist that I have uh, at the end of this session where you'll see the link and it's an easy one to remember as well but if this is a key thing in that checklist nailing down the objectives of the assessment um, it's just like any project you got to know what you're going after right okay. and, and and without that no one knows the objectives. Management doesn't know them. The team doesn't know them. And 
you, you need something for your recommendations to trace back to. Uh, there needs to be a traceability between your objectives, your findings, and your recommendations. Uh, well, all of that. That's, that's why I say you got to define your desired state. Where do you want to get to uh, when this whole thing's over? Yep. Yep. Okay, let's go on to number eight. Um, trying to implement all the recommendations at once. Now, you know, this is one of my hot buttons. Um, Tom, I'll let you speak to it first because I don't want to take all your wind here. Uh, but, but then I'll, I'll put my, my two cents in on, on well, top of I yours. Think, I think we're both, this is a hot button for both of us. Uh, people, they get all this list of uh, recommendations, and I try to prioritize my recommendations to the client. I know they can't implement everything. They just don't have the resources to do it. So, okay, what needs to be fixed first? And where are you going to get your most bang for your buck? And uh, so I try to prioritize the, my recommendations for them, and so they can implement incrementally. Right. And you know what I what I do is a real simple three tier thing where uh, I say divide it up into the things you can get done in the next one to two months. Uh, so that's the low-hanging fruit, and that will build your momentum. That will show some quick wins, and you can also at the same time be working on the mid-tier things that might take three to six months or so. Uh, and then as you're working on those two, you're probably showing some results. But then you got these really tough problems that may take, you know, six months to a year. You know, we're talking like putting a uh, an automation framework in place or implementing a review process or, or something like that that's just going to take some time. I, and you can be working on those too, but th those you know are going to take time. And by doing the earlier priorities first, it, it really shows some some progress. And, and overall, what I suggest is more of an, a planned organic kind of approach, it's like putting a garden in, you know. you you're not going to see all the fruit at once. You're not going to be able to plant everything at, at once. But so many times, you know, we, I've seen these big, like, center of excellence projects go up, and they try to roll it out to the entire organization all at once. And that's another thing to think about. You know, there may be some things you just want to try with a small team first, you know, and part of your organization before you roll it out to everybody. There's a lot of risk in doing that, a lot of risk in, in, in these massive rollouts, whether you're doing metrics or process or automation, you name it. Um, I, I like to play around in the sandbox first. I don't know about you, but anyway. Well, people have to see successes, and if you can get them to have these early successes, that builds momentum, and so they're willing to work harder on the ones that take a little longer. Yep, yep, it really does uh, get your feet solid. Now, trap number nine, uh, this is also a, a big one um, about not acting on the recommendations. And once again, I have an analogy for this. You know, it's like going to the doctor, getting an opinion from the doctor. He says, Randy, you're eating way too much chicken fried steak and you're not getting any exercise. You need to, you know, fix your diet, eat better, and get more exercise. I pay him my co-payment and I leave and I go home and I eat chicken fried steak that night and sit on the couch and watch the thunder lose. Um, you know, at, at that point, it's just a financial transaction that has occurred. I received information, but I really haven't taken any kind of action on it. And um, that's probably one of the worst things you can possibly do uh, as part of an assessment is just not doing anything. Right, and at least if you put try some of the recommendations, you haven't wasted all your money. Yep, that, that, that's right. And um, but you have a bullet here also about don't delay making the changes. You know, I think it's I think quick action, not 
you know, shoot from the hip kind of thing, but at least trying something, at least doing a proof of concept in an area, not waiting three months before you do something. Uh, you, you know, if you're, you, you see this with sporting teams, you know, they're, they're down by a large margin. It's amazing to me how quickly some coaches can make fast adjustments, you know, and, and totally change the game around. By, by doing something right away and so saying, well, okay, we're going to wait until the next quarter to do something. No, they do it, they do it right then. And uh, I also like your, your bullet here, plan for resistance, because it will happen. Uh, well, there will yeah. Be people- yeah. <laughs> and what I want, I want that resistance out in the open, because I can deal with resistance that's out in the open, but when it goes underground... You're in deep yeah. trouble, and I yeah, have had I've had CIOs call me in uh, two months later after the assessment and go, "We want to implement your assessment, but we don't know how." Right. Right. So well, they're, par- they're they're paralyzed with their indecision. One of the one of the issues Bill and I write about in the Top Ten Challenges book is a lot of people. Are held captive by their culture, and there are there are certain people that they're so entrenched in the culture, and change is hard. Okay, it's hard. It's, it's hard for all of us. But if you if you let the the point we make in in the top ten book is if you let the culture run the organization, then you're out of control. Uh, m- management is not in charge, and it's the culture that's running the organization. And uh, you really, I don't know, at that point, uh, you, you need a better strategy. <laughs> Just right. plain, and, plain and simple, you need to get in control. And then the the tenth trap um, is also one that I, I think is important because, you know, an assessment is a snapshot. And things are going to be different three months from now, six months from now, but... Many people, in fact, I would say 90% of the people that I assess never get a follow-up, which is just like, once again, kind of the medical analogy. It, you know, you need a follow-up to see how things are going. Um, it's not a catch to get more business, you know, because in my case, hey, my my business continues. This is for you. This is for the organization. Even if you do a self-assessment. You need a follow-up assessment because so many things change. Uh, do, do you have any uh, any thoughts on that one, Tom? Well, yeah. Uh, you never know whether, unless you do a follow-up assessment, you don't know how successful you were before, whether you actually fixed the problem or whether you induced other problems into the system. And so you need that follow-up and a lot of people will schedule the follow up and then business comes in and they don't they don't com- commit to that follow up right and and you make an excellent point uh under the solution uh um, point number 3 here that your previous assessment the the main one that you're focusing on is really your baseline if if anything else it's your baseline and what you're really trying to get at is how much can we move the needle off that baseline? And you're going to be much more successful using that as your benchmark than looking at company XYZ and saying, wow, look at all the cool things they're doing. You know, we need to be more like them. Well, I can, I can tell you that in just about any area of improvement, uh, especially like if you're looking at professional athletes, musicians, those kind of things, they they don't compare to other musicians and athletes. They compare to themselves. And I think that's what most organizations really need to be aware of, is that it's it's your organization that you need to be concerned about. Not to say that you can't pull in ideas from other companies and other organizations and use, you know, good ideas from other people, but th- th- their situations are different. They may be able to do things that you're just not equipped to do. So. Well, I agree. Okay. Okay. So, to... yep. So, so uh, let, let's put a wrap up on it here because we're about at our forty. Well, we're past the forty-five minute mark. 
But uh, why don't you lead us through some conclusions here, Tom? Well, you got to assessments, identify areas for improvements. And that's all they do is identify those areas. Uh, and uh, the upper management commitment, I think we've hit that very hard here, and that's essential. I won't go in unless I've got the CIO or the senior management's commitment that they will do you know, what we recommend or at least consider it and try to work it. And uh, it needs to be unbiased. We may come in and say the same thing somebody else has been saying all along. Uh, but, you know, we've got, you've got to do it. You've got to prioritize the recommendations. You need to plan for that resistance. You've got to know it's going to happen and then commit to the follow-up. Okay, very good. Well, for the for the questions part of this, I, I do see one here from uh, Laszlo who says, so is the retrospective meeting after every or every second sprint uh, kind of a small assessment? Um, uh, Laszlo, I would say uh, in a way it is, um, but, but retrospectives are really focused on one activity, okay, one project, one sprint, one release. Uh, maybe, you know, it, it's really, it, it's product focused, okay, and it seldom gets into uh, the the things around that. So, so if you're in like a dysfunctional culture and you're having trouble getting sprints performed, then an assessment would need to be much larger than the retrospective, although retrospectives are great. Don't get me wrong. I love them. They, they are needed. If we don't do them, we wind up repeating the same mistakes over and over again. So in a way, yes, they're an assessment, but they, they're a very, very small targeted assessment kind of on how we did. Um, now, if anyone else has a question, uh, you can pop it in here real quickly. Um, hey, Randy. On Laszlo's yeah. question, what I come up with, I'd read that a little differently. I don't know how he really meant it, but okay. to me, what when I when we go in and do the implementation, I want to go in and do what he would call a uh, retrospective. Go in and say, well, how did we do? Did we accomplish our goal on that implementation? So that is sort of a ongoing small assessment, but that does not negate the need for the follow-up assessment, you know, later on. Right, right. I, I, I would agree with that, too. So um, we've got to wrap this up here. Um, I, I, If you want the free assessment checklist, um, you can't see it on the link, but there's an underscore right here between assessment and checklist. But if you go to riceconsultant.com slash assessment underscore checklist dot doc, uh, I hope it's dot doc and not dot doc x. I may be wrong there. Anyway, uh, I'm going to put it out on the blog as well, uh, randallrice.blogspot.com. I'm going to push all this stuff out to all of you who have, um, who have signed up for the uh, webinar here. But you can download this. You can customize it. I, I made it where I intended for it to be stolen, so you can reproduce it without permission. I want you to be able to, to use that checklist. If you have trouble finding it, most of you know how to reach me through Facebook or, or the other thing. Okay, so it uh, or other means. Uh, I'm totally reachable. Uh, uh, now for the drawing, I have written down a number here. Uh, and I'm going to look to see who's still on the call, and that the number of that person in the list will be the winner of our drawing, and the number that I wrote down was the number four, okay? So I'm going to take a look to see who our attendees are. We have, looks like, 15 people on. So the first one is A. That's going to be kind of hard. Uh, we have Vento would be number two, Carl Cecil, oh man, you just missed it, buddy, you're number three, and the number four, Emma Bell from Columbus, Ohio, is the winner of the um, book Testing Dirty Systems. So uh, Emma, uh, Emma Ball, uh, I will be sending you an email and getting your address 
And um, so congratulations. You are the winner of the uh, of the book. And um, so I'll be doing this right. in the next webinar. So feel free to to join, you know, next one for another for another chance. Tom, you're okay, you, you want to put up, there you go. Uh, Randy and I have listed our contact information, our phone numbers, and our uh, email addresses. What I ask on you, if you send me an email, please use uh, in the t subject line webinar question or web something referring back to this webinar. Yeah, likewise for me too. Uh, R. Rice at riceconsulting.com or to Tom T. C. Staub at windridgeinternational.com. We're more than happy to answer your your questions that you may have from the webinar. Uh, Walt Walker, you're 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 a you're a wild and crazy guy, Walt. Clap clap clap. <laughs> I love it. Okay, thank folks, you, Walt. Uh, yes, thanks, Walt. Uh, so listen, folks, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, I really appreciate. Uh, Appreciate you being here today. Um, I try to do these about once a month. And so we're going to bring this one to a close. And I wish everyone a great uh, Memorial Day holiday weekend coming up. Hope you get out and get some rest and enjoy it. And Tom, thank you for being my partner in doing this webinar today. Um, it, I think we've had a really good uh, conversational kind of uh, uh, presentation. and. Uh, I hope that we can all kind of learn from each other as we go about doing this. So, well, um, I hope that you invite me to join you again. I certainly will. I certainly will. It's, it's been a good session. So thanks, everyone. I'm going to sign off now. We're going to stop the recording, and uh, we'll stay in touch and uh, look forward to maybe seeing you in a future webinar. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.